what I'm going to be talking about today is tools and technologies that I've been developing in my laboratory uh, at Burnham Institute for Molecular Research, uh, Medical Research, and a new company, Mandela Biosciences LLC. And just to remind you from, from yesterday's talk, uh, Mike West pointed out that embryonic stem cells and all pluripotent stem cells now that can be derived from skin uh, are truly remarkable in that they retain this, this ability once thought to be ascribed only to the immortal germline and that they can basically divide uh, indefinitely. And not only divide indefinitely, but they have the ability to turn into any cell type in our bodies. And th this confers uh, now to the somatic uh, tissue this ability to continually renew ourselves. So there's great potential of regenerative medicine uh, for curing diseases of aging and uh, other degenerative diseases. Now, the, the area, that's the potential. Now, the, the area of challenge is this area of embryomics. Uh, once you've gone from the pluripotent stem cell to now this multipotent stem cell uh, stage where you have early progenitors, but there's very little known about the surface molecules on these cells and how they change over time and how they interact with other cells. And we want to understand this so that we can reproduce in vitro what you've heard about in the earlier talks about how stem cell niches uh, operate in vivo so that we can produce enough of the types of cells that we need and of sufficient purity to do regenerative medicine. And of course, the end stage is the differentiated uh, mature cells. And these are not very difficult to produce in the laboratory. And as I said, what's difficult to, to do is to control the process to get enough of the types of cells in the, in a, the proper purity. Uh, we're working in, a, in our laboratories uh, with keratinocytes. We'd like to make skin in vitro from embryonic stem cells. These brain cells have differentiated from, along this pathway uh, from earlier progenitors to mature uh, or early uh, keratinocytes. You, we also can make uh, neurons and see, see patterning with uh, endothelial cells here. You can see branched endothelial patterns. Uh, and then sometimes you see unexpected things. While we were trying to make uh, keratinocytes, we saw fat cells appear. And also, along the same pathway, you can see multiple neurons and epithelial sheets. So how are we approaching this problem to define, uh, to find uh, markers of, of different progenitor cells in these early differentiating uh, stem cells, which we call embryomics? Uh, well, what, the way we're using, the method we're using is called phage display, and this is simply a technique where you can display uh, tens of billions of different peptides on the surface of a bacteria, bacterial virus uh, particle called a bacteriophage. And what, these, what, what this does then is it connects the phenotype to the genotype. And you, you take these billions of compounds and put them through a screening assay, usually an affinity assay, and it reduces the complexity down from 10 billion to just a few dozen different peptides. And these peptides then uh, will have the properties that you've selected for, like binding or internalization into specific cell types. And when we do this in a general way, using traditional phage display, we can find peptides. In this case, we first time we did it, we found this family of peptides having an RXXR consensus sequence, which bind very strongly and internalize into these early differentiating cells, but they, did, they enter large, large subpopulations. And we don't think that they're just for one type of progenitor, but for multiple types of progenitors. We could show that they internalize in this confocal uh, image here, with the red being the phage and the blue as a nucleus. And finally, we can, we th we're developing ways to track these particles by conjugating them to quantum dots. And so you see here quantum dot conjugated phage particles that got in through these peptides to these early uh, progenitor cells. And then we followed them for 30 days. And during that 30 days, you, we got differentiation to cardiomyocytes. And we can see where these cells are. 
from these progenitors in relationship to the cardiomyocytes. But with this method, you can't select for, you can't a priori decide we want to select for progenitors of, say, endothelial cells or cardiomyocytes or uh, hepatocytes, for example. And so we developed a more focused technique in order to be able to do that. And I'm going to show you some of the early data that suggests that this new technique is working. Uh, but before I show you that, I have to show you an observation which led us to devise this new methodology. And this is the unexpected finding that if you take a targeted bacteriophage, uh, which has one of these peptides as I described, and you apply it to mammalian cells, in this case differentiating embryonic cells, uh, it will enter the cell and internalize, and the DNA from that, from, from those pages can be recovered from the cells days and actually weeks after the initial exposure of the cells to the, to the phage. Uh, if you do this at the same time you include an untargeted phage, the control phage, which does, does not display a peptide, uh, that DNA rapidly is degraded. So there's a separate pathway involving internalization that protects the DNA. And we've shown this in our laboratory, and my colleague uh, Andrew Baird at UCSD has shown the identical results, actually going out to six weeks, and he can go out to months, uh, showing that the phage uh, DNA from the targeted particles is stable in the embryonic, uh, in, in this case, in mammalian cells for, for weeks. So with that knowledge, we got the idea that internalized phage DNA could be uh, used as a record of what happened to a cell or a cell's ancestors at an earlier point in time. So we can actually use it, the, phage, the stabilized phage DNA as an archaeological record of where that cell was at or where that ancestor of that cell was at uh, earlier in time. So we can, the way we do this is we apply a library to the progenitors we then remove all the, all the phage that don't stick and only uh, allow the binders to internalize. And so now these cells have internalized phage based on the peptides that they display. So they must have a receptor for those peptides. Now this receptor profile can change with time as the cells differentiate. But th what we want to know is what happened back here for all these different cell types. So we, at, as the cells are just differentiated, you can identify them uh, based on morphology or specific markers very easily. So let's say we have cardiomyocytes. We can isolate those cardiomyocytes that differentiated from these phage treated cells and then we can uh, extract the DNA, amplify it and sequence it and, and from that DNA figure out what peptides were targeted to the progenitor cells. And we can test that by making phage from those peptides, from that DNA encoding the peptides, and put those phage back onto the progenitor cells. And we've done this experiment in a system where we're differentiating to endothelial cells, and the marker for mature endothelial cells is CD31. And so you can see here in this time course, this is human embryonic stem cells, that at day 12, uh, there are, only, there are progenitors for endothelial cells, but there are no CD31 expressing cells. And over time, after day 18, they start to develop where a several percentage of the cells are now expressing CD31 and have differentiated under, under the conditions here. So we applied a library of, again, tens of billions of peptide phage at day 12, let them differentiate, did a fact sort of the CD31 positive cells isolated the DNA, amplified it, and then uh, recloned it back into phage particles and sequenced those indi individual phage. And we found about a dozen peptides that if we apply, now reapply them as phage clones, just displaying one, pep one of these peptides, you can find them binding and internalizing into the cells. And this pattern here is very intriguing and it's very different from what I showed you earlier with the traditional phage display where large uh, populations of cells are picking up the phage. Here we see a very typical pattern when we do this type of selection where we see small little patches. You have to hunt around in the dish to find these little patches and, and it suggests, as you would expect for a progenitor population, 
they're just getting started, so there's only one or two in, in small colonies uh, getting ready to differentiate into uh, endothelial cells. Now, the intriguing thing about this one peptide is we put it on uh, UVEC cells, umbilical cord endothelial cells, which are CD31 positive, and these cells are easily targeted by, by this peptide phage. And if you put control phage on, you don't see this. And if you put other peptide phage on, you don't see this. So we know that this can target CD31 positive cells, and it can target the progenitors. So how do we now uh, provide evidence that this very cell is the one, or this group of cells, is going to become the CD31 positive cells from the progenitors? And we're doing that by physically tracking the particles by first conjugating them to quantum dots, as you saw before. And I'm working with uh, Jeffrey Price at, at uh, the Burnham Institute, who has a setup where he can do time-lapse uh, photofluorescent uh, microscopy. And we can actually make movies of these cells that have taken up the phage and watch them as they divide, migrate, and differentiate, and then look for co-localization of a marker for the differentiated cell type with those quantum dots. And that's work that's in progress. I don't have time to show you all the data. Another approach we're taking is uh, a quantitative approach where we do quantitative PCR after the cells have differentiated. And so we can look at the population of CD31 positive cells, measure the peptide phage uh, using quantitative PCR in both the CD31 positive and negative populations. And that way, determine uh, how much of the progenitor cells have actually become endothelial cells. So we have that tracking method. And an exciting area that we're just getting into um, is using phage, which is a little simpler and more direct, is, is just use phage-mediated gene delivery. So now, instead of tracking them with a quantum dot labeled phage, we have a, a phage particle that contains within its genome a reporter gene driven by a mammalian promoter. And now only cells that have the proper receptor for, the, for that targeted phage will express the uh, reporter gene. And we know this works because uh, I think about eight to ten years ago, uh, Andrew Baird and myself invented this technique. And we've shown it with a number of different ligands, and it's been repeated many times in the literature. And in fact, there's a recent paper out last month where uh, EGF targeted phage particles were used to introduce uh, interference RNA so and successfully bring down the uh, expression of a reporter gene. So here you're seeing, in, uh, we've done it in tissue culture, you can do it in primary cultures, we can do it in vivo. Uh, this is rat, newborn rat, brain explants, and the progenitors of these cells pick up the phage particles and then uh, express GFP in the olfactory bulb and various brain cells. So that's work that's in progress, and we're very excited about that because not only does it provide you a tool to track the progenitors for which you found targeting peptides, it gives you a tool to genetically manipulate specific populations of progenitor cells in your dish as you're differentiating your embryonic stem cells. And I should mention that I, I think we're focusing on in vitro techniques because we want to develop this as an industrial method uh, for producing cells for therapy, but it's also applicable to in vivo uh, analysis. And finally, I just want to end up in the, in the last couple of minutes tell you that we're not just uh, looking at peptides, we're also doing something I call embryome display, which is uh, displaying cDNAs, which contain the repertoire of proteins that are made by these early differentiating embryonic cells. Here we've taken from two to 14 day embryoid bodies, and every other day we harvested RNA from these embryoid bodies. We made a cDNA library. Uh, we normalized it to get all the different uh, messages at the same level so we can query them at, you know, with equal opportunity. And then we uh, made the library and, and analyzed it for diversity. And we can make uh, typically libraries of a size of about 300,000 to 3 million uh, individual page clones, which very well represent all these uh, different transcripts. And if we use a technique where we fragment the cDNA before we display it, we can also uh, query 
these libraries for active domains of larger proteins. And most active ligands, as you well know, are, are, tra are processed from larger uh, pre-proteins. And we proved this uh, concept several years ago, again with Andrew Baird, we, we took uh, the EGF precursor. EGF itself is a very small molecule, only about 50 uh, kilodaltons, but it's, it's small, it's part of a bigger precursor. If we fragment this, display the fragments on phage, and then introduce these display phage carrying the GFP gene to mammalian cells that have the EGF receptor, and then select GFP positive cells, we find overlapping uh, ligands that if you take the overlap region, it defines the mature EGF to within five amino acids. And so we think we can use this to query the embryo for new uh, active domains that interact with early progenitor cells. And not only have, can be used for uh, probing these cells and tracking them and identifying them and isolating them, but maybe also manipulate, manipulating them if they have biological activity. And I think I'll stop there. I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues at the Burnham Institute, Mark McCullough, Evan Snyder, Jeffrey Price, or Bruce Lani. Uh, especially want to thank Michael West, who really brought me into this field, uh, invited me to work with him on, on, this, on the embryo and uh, apply phage display techniques to it. Uh, Andrew Baird is a longtime colleague working on phage display with me, and Ying Chow is helping me get a new company started called Mandela Biosciences to develop these tools and technologies. Thank you.